quiz. One question quiz. I want you tonight to find for me the first place the animal sacrifice for sin was atoned for. First place in the Bible. The shedding of blood was for the atonement of sin in the Bible. Well, I want you to find it. I want you to look it up. I want you to give us chapter, verse. <laughs> Linda would. <laughs> she would know it in her head. And uh, no Googling, no uh, cheating. I, 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 I. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, in, in, in a minute. I uh, just want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you up in Maine and Sajiv in India. Oh, and the other thing was Sajiv had a great, great campaign. And so there was uh, quite a few people there, and uh, I believe uh, we'll wait for the report and pictures to come. But God bless you, Sajiv, if you're watching. We love you. Praise the Lord. I'm glad we had a great campaign there in India. All right, Bobby, go ahead. Take a crack at it. Okay, who else? Huh? God did it. We know God did it. What? Yes. You guys know your stuff. I'm proud of you. That's right. It was uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And uh, maybe you can put that up there. We can read that. And I'll tell you what some of the other versions say. Because we're studying the, the uh, chapter 7 tonight. We're studying the first mention principle. And it's very, very important that we get this first principle under our belt. And it looks like most of you have. And that's great. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And the Bible says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And I believe it's the uh, New Living Bible says, And, and God also, it says, Adam, uh, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make uh, animal skins for, and clothe them. So there had to be the killing of an animal. There had to be a shedding of blood. And so the covering that was there uh, God instituted that. What? You have it wrong? No? Okay, I thought you were going, no, it's not there. Uh, the Lord made coats of skins. Well, if he had made coats of skins, that means something had to die. And because something had to die, there was a shedding of the blood. And so the principle here with first mention is that God did it. Man didn't do it. God did it. God brought... The covering for sin upon man. Man could never bring the covering upon themselves. Because remember, Adam and Eve tried to do that with the fig leaves. Now, if God wanted that, he would have just said, okay, you guys are all set. You covered yourselves. No. Man was not able to cover themselves, so God covered them. But it took the life of something and the blood to be shed of something for them to be covered. <clears throat> so when you see that in first principle mentioned in Scripture, that holds true all the way through. The problem with Israel was their sacrifices became meaningless because they didn't apply it. They didn't, they didn't keep that first principle mentioned that God is doing, God is, is being satisfied, no one else. Um, and when you do that, when you take it in that context, you see that God initiated it. Adam and Eve didn't initiate it. God initiated it. God so loved the world, he initiated it, right? He sent his only son. We didn't ask for a son. We didn't ask for a savior. He sent it. God did, says in his word, we did not choose him, but he chose us. And so that theme all the way through the Bible stands true. So as long as you keep that truth, 
And understand that your good works cannot bring you to heaven. Your good works can make you in right standing with God. That God has done it. God has justified you. God has sanctified you. And God will glorify you. Amen? So understand that. And I know sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, well, you know, I got this problem. I'm still struggling with this. And I'm still struggling with that. But you know what? That's the sanctification process. And as long as you're allowing God to continue to work on you and confessing your sins, he's faithful and just to what? To forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of me from all unrighteousness. So the definition of uh, the first mention of principle is that the principle by which the interpretation of any verse is aided by considering the first time its subject appears in the scripture. And that's what we just went over. The first place, because a lot of people... A lot of people will uh, go to Cain and Abel. That was the shedding of the blood. And that's, that's normal. They would just go to that because unless you really, really study and look at it, you would, you would overlook that. But I think we taught on that before about Adam and, uh, Adam and Eve and, and stuff like that. Okay, well, let me ask you this. What was the first commandment of God? Where was the first commandment of God? Wait, don't, don't be yelling out stuff. Who, who just said that? Yes. Well, in the Bible, we're, you know, the first commandment in the Bible. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to take a guess? All right, hold that thought for a minute. Hold that thought for a minute if you're guessing. Someone, someone. Where is the first commandment in the Bible? Yes. A lot of people think it's the Ten Commandments. You know, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's not the first commandment in the Bible. The first commandment that man ever, ever received from God was, you may eat of all the trees of, 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 the, of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. That's a command. So that's the first command of the Bible. Okay. So what's the first command that God gave to Adam and Eve? What was it? You shall not eat. You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat it, you shall, you shall die. Did they die that day? Okay. So there was more to it than just, you know, them saying, okay, I'm going to die today. No, it was that you would be initiating death. What is death? Death is separation. Okay. So they had a death spiritually where their spirit was separated from God. That's a principle of first mention. Okay? And so if you keep that tied in with what I said before about the sacrifice and how God provides it, that <clears throat> we cannot save ourselves. See, there are those who think they can save themselves by good works. You go right back to these two scriptures and you can show them it's unacceptable with God. Amen? So you go back to the first principle of the law was first given to Adam and Eve. Thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the very first commandment that God gave to mankind. All right? So, let's see. Many times in the Bible you'll read... Uh, something. Um, I'm going to take for an example the vine. When you look at the vine and you read in, in when Jesus was talking about the vine and, and the branches and all of those things, what does the vine represent? Source of life? Hmm? Well, the principle of first mention, when you go back into the Bible in Isaiah, the vine is referred to Israel. Okay? So when you go through that and you read that, it becomes so much clearer to you about different things. Now, not every scripture that was talking about the vine will be that. You know, sometimes you can use the word, uh, I'll take for an example, the word body. 
Sometimes it means body of Christ. Sometimes it means body of water. Sometimes it means your physical body. So one word can mean different things. You just got to find the context. And so always remember that the context will de determine the meaning, but also go back to first principle when you're not really sure what it means. Again, we used it. I think I talked about this maybe two weeks ago. In Revelation chapter 12 about uh, the woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the stars. A lot of your new commentaries today are saying that the woman is the church. Well, the reason why they say it's the church, hmm? the reason why they say it's the church is because it, it promotes their doctrine of belief of going through the tribulation period. They don't believe in the rapture of the church before the tribulation, they believe after. So in order for that to happen, in, in chapter 12, they've got to interpret it that because they, they believe that that is the church. I find no scriptural evidence whatsoever that it can be the church. None. Uh, and I wish somebody would show me that it is the church. It is the ecclesia, the called out ones, that the woman represents that. And uh, I don't believe there's any scripture that does verify that. However, using the what? First mentioned principle, and you see the woman has the sun, the moon, and the stars around her head. You go back into Genesis, and where do you see the sun, moon, and stars? Where do you see that? With Joseph. Who was Joseph? One of the sons of Israel. Did you know that? You knew that? Did you really know that? Are you able? <laughs> okay. Maybe you did know that. Pretty cool if you knew that. Good one. So again, that's how you can tell interpretation. Is going back to the first principle of mention. When you go back and you see the sun and the moon and stars around the woman, the woman has to be Israel. Okay. Now there's a lot of anti-Semitism today, and there's a lot of people that uh, have promoted replacement theology. They they believe the church has replaced uh, Israel, and that Israel has no more part in God's plan. Uh, that's absolutely ludicrous because the Bible says in Romans that God is able to graft them in again. And if he spared not thee, uh, them, take heed lest he spare not thee also, the scripture says, meaning to the Gentile. Uh, Gentiles can't get so puffed up in thinking that God is all done with the Jews when he's not all done with the Jews. Um, trust me, he's not. He has blessed Israel to, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, the desert blooms again, according to the prophecy of Isaiah. Is fulfilled in Israel today, to our day. The desert is, is blossoming. We saw it, right, hon? How the, the desert in Israel is blossoming and the agricultural uh, ingenuity and all of those things that they've done, uh, they're blessed okay, in that land. And um, But a lot of people want to cut out Israel, want to cut out because they're anti-Jew, uh, anti-Semitic. And that's not true. Uh, we do not believe in replacement theology, so... Again, the woman represents Israel. So if you always remember that, don't look at one scripture, take it out of context, and say, okay, this is what it means. No, go back and look at, through the whole Bible. Look at every single book. Look and see what that word means in every single scripture. And then you'll draw, a, you know, it's like a puzzle. You know, you, you, you have a puzzle, and, and you look at it, and when you look at it, first look at it, you don't really recognize what it is, unless, of course, you look at the box. But if you just had a, a, a brown box and all these pieces came together and said, this is a puzzle, put it together, you'd be scratching your head wondering what it is until all the pieces come together. Well, it's the same way when you're studying the scriptures, that when you look at things, look at them as a puzzle, and if you're not sure of what the, pic the whole picture is, take in consideration all the things that we've already talked about when you're interpreting the Bible. Because so many people are into the mystical interpretation or the allegorical interpretation where they're actually changing the context. When you do that, you'll get all messed up. Okay, and you'll be saying things that, you know, um, like some preachers on TV saying that, well, since Adam had all power over the animals and everything, he could fly. But that's what they're saying. They're saying because he had authority over the dominion over the birds of the air, that meant that Adam could fly. And um, okay, and 
I say, well, I wasted all that airfare going to Africa when I could have flown myself because I have we have authority, right? Now, see that, but those are the we la we laugh at those things. But do you understand that there are thousands of Christian people today that believe that? Okay, okay, uh, simply because they don't know the scriptures, they don't know theology, they don't know, you know, about principle of first mention. They don't know about context. And that's why she is so cute. And that's why, you know, we have to be so careful when we're interpreting the Bible. The first uh, principle of mention is so important uh, and um, necessary uh, to understanding what certain scriptures are meant by when they're quoted. How many times we've quoted scriptures out of context? Like the scripture, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. How many has ever quoted that scripture? Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this question. What does that scripture mean? Hmm? How did you know that? How did you know that? What does it mean? Hmm? Never be never let me let me say this. Never be scared to answer because you know what? When you don't know something and you and you find out what the answer is, then you know. It's a good thing. Yes, Bob. Right. In other words, in the context of that, okay, it doesn't mean that, you know, okay, we're Pentecostal, so wherever two or three are gathered, here he is in the midst. It doesn't mean that. What it meant in Scripture was that it was, a, I think it was a brother in sin, as a matter of fact, and that they had to be corrected, and, and that when you would correct that brother, if he wouldn't listen, you take two more with you, and if he wouldn't listen, that in, in, you know, in two or three, where two or three are gathered in my authority, I am there in the midst. So in other words, it's as if he, he, is, he is the one that's bringing the, the correction or the instruction or judgment. And see, that's why I don't agree with people on Facebook that say, oh, don't judge, don't judge. No, we're supposed to judge. We're supposed to judge those that are within the body of Christ, not those that are without the body of Christ, because they're only living in their own, own nature. They're only doing the things that they're supposed to be they're doing. They're just naturally responding to the things of the world. That's who they're under. They're under the satanic influence. But as Christians, 1 Corinthians says that we're to judge those that are within. We are to judge those within. So all these people on Facebook that are going around saying, oh, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. No, the Bible says we're supposed to. Paul made a judgment about a man that was having his mother-in-law in sexual relationships. He says, take that man and put him out of the church. And he also committed one brother in which some of us would cringe today if I ever did this. Okay, if I turn somebody over to Satan that they may be saved, their flesh may be saved. If I came out and said, I'm turning him over to Satan, a lot of you would probably run out of church and never come back again. But that's what the Apostle Paul did. He turned someone over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that he might be saved. <laughs> wow, is that the kind of church you want? That's biblical. Okay, But we got a lot of wacky, packy little Christians today, you know, little crybabies, I don't know if you saw my cereal box on uh, Facebook today. Wimpy Christians. Yeah. Wimpy, wimpy Flakes, was it? 
because people can't take correction today. What do you, what, why do you think that is? Why do you think that spirit is overtaking our society? That they need a safe space. Why? Why, do, why is it that they don't want you to correct anybody or, or to speak you know, something into some, to somebody that might be disagreement, it might hurt their feelings? Why? So they can be deceived for the Antichrist. So they can be deceived and not be corrected, not, you know, just accept everyone, accept everything. Don't be divisive. Don't be, you know, be tolerant. I see those stickers all the time. I want to rip them right off of people's Bible uh, bumpers. Coexist, yeah, you know, be tolerant. Oh, I can be tolerant, but if I, if I disagree with you, then you want to beat me up because I'm not agreeing with you? Who's not being tolerant? So anyway, getting back to the study that the principle of first mention and, and having these scriptures in the context, you know, like uh, how many times you heard, oh, the Spirit of the Lord is here and Jesus is walking up and down the aisle. No, he's not. Is he? Is he? No. Where's Jesus? Where? Where? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Even when he came back to correct Paul, he didn't, his feet didn't touch the ground. A light shone from heaven, knocked him down. Again, misnomer, he was on a horse. The Bible doesn't say that. I could be walking like this and be knocked to the ground. Again, a misnomer. They think it's how it happened. Why? Could, Paul couldn't have walked? We talked about that. I believe he was walking because it was the 12th, I think it was the 12th hour, it was the time of prayer. And, he, and at that time, you, you stood on the ground, you faced toward, toward Jerusalem, and you'd pray. So again, always remember, don't go by what people say. When I was in, when I was in Nigeria, I gave a question to somebody. I said, um, you know, in leadership, you've got to know your limit, you've got to know your limitations, because we don't know everything, you know? That's why we need each other. And after, the, after that, one of the pastors, he was young, about two years, two years in the ministry, he raised his hand. He said, I have a question. We had a question and answer time. And he said to me, Pastor, um, you said that we have to know our limits. I said, that's true. And then he, said, and then he quoted Philippians. He says, well, I, the Bible says we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. I said, that's a, good, that's a very good question. I said, I'm going to answer it this way. I said, after, after the... Uh, class is over, I says, Bishop and I are going to take you up to the mountain, and we're going to throw you off the cliff, and we'll go down and pick you up on the other end, and you should be okay. Well, they all busted out laughing, of course, you know, and he put his head down. I said, can't you do all things through Christ? I said, no, you can't. I said, there's limitations. I said, let's look at that scripture and see what it means, and we went back into context again. That's when he says, I have learned to be abased, I've learned to abound, I've learned to be cold, I've learned to be warm, I've learned to have food and have none, I've learned all these things. But I can do all things, those things, through Christ, which strengthens me. Okay? Then another brother uh, stood up and he said, um, well, the Bible says, he, he says, well, the Bible says that we can have whatever we want by what we say. Okay? That's, that's, that's a good question, you know. Uh, I says, uh, so you can have everything you want by what you say. You can speak it into existence. That's what it was. You can speak anything into existence, you can have it. So after I went up to him, and I walked right up to him where Nelson was, and I said, where's that in the scripture? And he put his head down. He said, I, I don't know. He said, that's what I hear the preachers say. I said, don't ever Establish truth on what a preacher says. Establish truth by the Bible. I says, I know where that scripture is. It's found, in, it's found in Romans. I says, when God is speaking to Abraham and Paul is reiterating what God is speaking to Abraham, and he says to Abraham, you know, that it was, it was God who spoke those things that are not as though they were to Abraham. You're going to be like the sands of the sea and your offspring's going to do this and your offspring's going to do that, you know, and the stars in heaven and all this other stuff. I said, God spoke that as, as though it was as though, as though it was before it was. Not us. 
But again, I'm using these examples tonight to show you the principle of first mention, that if we get away from that, we're going to have all kinds of weird, and we do. We have all kinds of weird doctrines, all kinds of people on, t on television saying all kinds of crazy, crazy things. Jesus needed to be born again. Are you serious? To, for Jesus to be born again means he had a sinful nature. And if he had a sinful nature, he couldn't be the perfect sacrifice. So watch out for the Creflo Dollars. Watch out for the Kenneth Hagins. Watch out for the uh, Kenneth Copelands and uh, Joyce Myers and, and uh, the other, I forget whatever her name was, um, Marilyn Hickey. Forget about those people that are coming out and telling you Jesus had to be born again. He was the first one born in hell. You know, he became satanic on the cross. All because, all because they take a scripture, and, and, the, and I think it's in Genesis, about the serpent on the pole. And it's like, the serpent represented judgment in that context. No, I'm sorry. It, it represented healing, because when they looked at the serpent, they were healed. That's right. That wasn't judgment. It was healing. So again, that doesn't mean that the serpent did the healing. It meant that God was getting the victory through on the pole for sickness and disease over the enemy. The enemy was defeated. So again, don't go by what these teachers are teaching on, on TV, that Jesus was the first one that was born again. That's a bunch of crock. Think, all you've got to do is think about it and say, wait a minute, if Jesus had to be born again, that means he was a sinner. Right? We all were born again because we're. So Jesus wasn't born again. How many, how many believe Jesus was not born again? Please raise your hand. You're scaring me. Oh, okay. Okay, good. He didn't need to be born again. He was the son of God. He was perfect. There was no sin in him at all. And then the other scripture that's taken out of context is he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He became sin. Question, how do you become something that's abstract? So you're telling me that Jesus became a homosexual? Jesus became an adulterer? Well, he became sin. Bible says so there's a wrong interpretation but when you go into the when you go into the study of that it says it means that he became a sin offering not literal sin he became a sin offering but see they say he became sin he became satanic on the cross how blasphemous how blasphemous that is He didn't become satanic on the cross. He didn't take on Satan's nature. He didn't take on a fallen nature. How crazy is that? But that's the teachings that are out there. And believe me, if, I, if I'm not exaggerating, there must be hundreds of thousands of Christians that believe that junk. They believe that. Why do they believe that? Because not only is there a spirit of truth, but there is a spirit of error. That little spirit will sit right on your shoulder and will speak into your ear and tell you things and make things look. Look at all how that's all how all the cults started. They'll tell you that the Holy Spirit's not a person because they read it in a book. And the guy gave uh, compelling evidence to it, but everything is out of context. That's why I'm so, I'm so proud of you guys that you knew the first time that the sacrifice was mentioned in the Bible, that it was Adam and Eve. That God made that covering for them. Because one thing, I don't feel I'm wasting my time when I'm teaching you. Because you need to know these things. You know, uh, when you leave this place, you won't be fooled. Okay. 
When you read something and it says the Holy Spirit's not a person, just stop and take that thing, rip it up, throw it in the garbage, burn it, whatever you can. Okay? There's stuff out there, there's cults out there, and there's, there's people that I want to deceive and, and uh, get you so far away from the truth, it's unbelievable. Know your scripture. If I say something, you know the scripture. Look it up in the scriptures. If, it, if what I'm saying agrees with scripture, praise God. If it doesn't, come to me and tell me. Say, oh, I don't, I don't see that in scripture. You know, just make sure that you know you come in the right spirit. Don't come with a know-it-all spirit. Because uh, I just don't handle know-it-all spirits that well. Okay. I just, uh, I'll ask questions and I'll ask um, chapters, verses. I'll ask context. Don't give me your feelings and emotions. Don't cry and say, I really believe God showed me this. That means nothing to me. What means is context. You show me in the scriptures. And if it's true, I'll believe it and I'll receive it. I'm not wimpy. I'm not a wimpy, crispy uh, little... Uh, Bible uh, believing everything people say. You know, you show me from the scriptures, and if it's true, I'll believe it. You know, and if it's not, I'm not going to believe it, and, uh, unless you can give me proof. So again, um, that's not being obstinate. That's being, you know, relying upon God to and others and books and commentaries and people uh, that have had years and years of experience in expository preaching uh, that I can look at and study and mull around in my brain and, and sit there and say, you know what? Hmm. I don't really quite believe that. I don't really quite think that's correct. And so um, that's what's so important. You know, it's really funny, though, because, you know, I've been in this thing for over 36 years, and you'll be surprised. I have people come up to me, and, and they just, hey, did you know this, 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 and this? And I'm like, you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Not a clue. And I just let them talk and let them spew on their stuff. You know? and then I'll tell them, well, have you ever thought of this? And they go, oh, wow, no. So well, think about it. Think about it. I'm not trying to throw stuff on you that I believe. I'm trying to expound the scripture to you. What I believe, what you believe isn't important. What is the truth, that's what's important. And if we hold on to that. Amen? So what are the qualifications? Okay. The first step in using the first principle method is to accurately locate the first mention. Always keep that in the back of your mind. You know. Um, I'm trying to think offhand. You know, when Jesus quoted that scripture in Isaiah, and he said, um, um, well is it spoken that Isaiah said your, that your lips speak of me but your heart well, how does that scripture go? Right. Isaiah, well has Isaiah said you know you worship me with your lips but your heart is far from me. Well go back in Isaiah. Jesus was quoting Isaiah. So for the ones that say we don't need the Old Testament anymore they better go back and check it out because Jesus quoted quite a bit from the Old Testament. Okay, I love the Old Testament. Now, I don't know if you, how many of you spend time in the Old Testament, but yeah, the Old Testament, and I think that's been one of our strong points here in For His Glory is teaching out of the Old Testament, preaching out of the Old Testament, uh, getting principles and, and getting those principles and applying them and helping to understand them in the light of the New Testament. Because you need to understand the enlightenment of the Old Testament and the New Testament and how they, they kind of uh, you know integrate with each other, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so when you when you do that, that's great. So the qualification is accurately locate the first mention. Like the sun, the moon, and the stars. It says in Revelation, where, where was that mentioned again? You know, you start thinking about that. Is that ever mentioned again? It's, and you know, you can Google that. Sun, and moon, and stars. And it'll come up in Genesis. And you go back and read that in Genesis. It's like Isaiah. When Isaiah... Well has Isaiah spoken of you, that you speak of me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Go back and read in Isaiah. What was the context there? What were the Israelites doing? Okay. What was the, what were they, how were they living? Well, to make a, a, a long story short, um, Isaiah was a prophet, right? 
And he was speaking the things of God, and what did the people do? They sawed him in half. <laughs> okay, they didn't have a power saw. <laughs> okay. They tied him down and sawed him in half. So you can see how well has Isaiah prophesied of you. You speak of me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Because if you were, if my hearts were not far from me, you would have accepted my prophet who I sent. But instead you killed him. Again, go back and look at that. There's so much richness. There's so much that you can glean from there. Um, we got a three-volume set on, I, on Isaiah. I, I think, was it Young? Is it, was it Young, honey? Do you remember his name? It's three volumes. It's, it's excellent. You can, you can get, that vo get those volumes and read it. It's awesome. I just started reading The Paradigm by um, Jonathan Kahn. Just got it in today, so I just was reading the preface and stuff like that. That looks like a very interesting book. I'll probably read that in a couple of sittings. And just get there and just start reading and reading. Knock that book out. Because it has to do with paralleling things that are happening today. Have you read it, Ann? No? Do you have it? Not yet? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Okay, I won't. You, you read it? See, Jeanette read it already. She's already up on it. So you can give us a book report, huh? And she goes, oh, huh, what, what? <laughs> no. The Paradigm. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Kahn, CBD, 1099. Hardcover. It sounds like Raymond, right? Redman, right? CBD, Paradigm, 1099. Brother Diamond told me about it, so I got it. Whee! Okay. All right, so. Never refer only to the first mention of, of a word in the Bible. Rather, try to discover if the principle of that word has been demonstrated previous to its use. Always remember that. Like you read in Revelation, here's the woman with the stars, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Don't just take them as literal. Okay? Because there's symbolism. What was the symbolism? Wow. Don't just take it and say, well, that was literal stars, the moon, and the sun. That's literal. No, it's not. It's symbolic. Okay, it's a metaphor. It's not literal. And so that's why you can't take the hyperliteralism, this what's called hyperliteralism. People will take that and they'll take it to the extreme. Oh, the Bible says if your hand offends you, cut it off. Harriet, get the saw. Doesn't mean that. Or if your eye offends you, pluck it out. That's not literal. Okay? It's, met it's a me metaphor or symbolic. Doesn't mean that you have to pluck your eye out. It means that you distaste, you distaste it and hate it as much as you want. You would want to pluck your eye out to avoid doing that thing, seeing that thing, or doing that thing. So, again, make sure that it says you're not just going by what the uh, you know what it literally says because sometimes it may not be that no subsequent mention of a subject should be used to contradict or violate that which is in the first mention that's exactly what the commentators do with Re revelation chapter 12 they say the woman represents the church and they have no proof that the woman is the church. And I say, to, I say to them, prove it to me. I want you to prove to me that the woman is the church. How can you do that scripturally? Well, we can interchange it because the church is, is no longer Israel anymore. God is, you know, that's a replacement theology. So I already know where they're going with that when they come to me with that. And I say, no, you can't, you can't do that. You can't add that. You're changing the context of the scripture. So again, go back to the principle of first mention. And don't use it in any way to contradict other scriptures. You can't. It's impossible. The first mentioned principle may be used in relation to all subjects of it, of it, but its limitations should always be kept in full view. It must not be overemphasized. Rather, it must be kept in its proper perspective. 
Okay, because principle of first mention, uh, such as um, um, let's see, maybe uh, if I can think of one off the top of my head. Um, okay, um, you know when the Bible talks about uh, that, uh, I think it was Paul when he was talking about Christ being the rock that followed Israel into the, into the wilderness, that he was the rock. If you take that literally, oh, Jesus was a rock before he became a man. Okay? <laughs> I know we laugh at that, but there are people that will make doctrine out of that. You know, oh, yeah, that rock that followed him in the desert, that was Christ. You know, yes, it was Christ symbolically as a rock, something solid you could put your faith into and, and be established on, you know. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We should sing that song. But it doesn't mean that Christ is a, is a rock. Okay? He's not literally a rock. But symbolically, he's, he's like a rock. He's solid, you know, steadfast, unmovable, you know. And so that way you can take that. But don't take things like that literally because then, then he's a tower. <laughs> he's a rock. You have to be careful. So, again. The first principle mentioned should never be used alone to interpret a verse, and it's insufficient for a full, and as, as it is insufficient for a full interpretation. This principle must be used in conjunction with others. In other words, like I said, they insert the church with no, no justification for that whatsoever. The woman is the church. How do you get that? I gave you biblical principles of principle of first mention of how the sun and the moon and the stars, what that represents, and when it was first mentioned, and it follows all the way through Scripture. So therefore, it has to be the woman representing Israel. But be, people love their pet doctrine so much that they'll hold on to it and say, nope, 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 it's the woman. Well, give me evidence that it is the woman. Is the, I mean, the, that the woman is the church. Give me evidence that the woman is the church. Maybe I'll give you that for an assignment. See if you can find it in the, that the woman is the church. Go look it up. You won't find it. It's not there. Then we have demonstration. In Romans 3, 24 and 25, it says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood. The subject of these verses is justification by grace through faith in the blood of Christ. But when you see the word blood, what does, it, what, what does that mean to you? When you see the word blood, what does that mean to you? Suffering, life, yes, life, life. When you see blood, there had to be a life taken. So when we, we talk about the blood of Jesus, okay, has anybody had the literal blood of Jesus poured on them? No, he's not here. Okay, But it's symbolic of his life. Right? They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. Well, how did he overcome him? By the blood of the Lamb. Was it the blood of a Lamb? Or is that symbolic of Christ? Now, was it Christ's blood? Or was it that he, he lived a life that overcame, he overcame the enemy and his temptations? He never sinned. He overcame Satan's attacks. He overcame him by the Word of God. He quoted the Word of God. He lived in total obedience to God. And to the will of God, there was no sin in him, so that made him to be the only sacrifice for sin. And he laid down his life for his friends, and he gave his life freely. The enemy didn't take his life. Rome didn't take his life. He laid down his life. So if he laid down his life, and it's his blood, 
It's his life. He gave his life. He shed his blood for the remission of sins. He gave his life for the remission of sins. Leviticus says the life is in the it's in the blood. Lose your blood, you lose your life. <laughs> you have no life if you don't have blood, right? In Zechariah, Zechariah 4, 6, you know the scripture says, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> what was he trying to say here? Word of encouragement. Okay. Yep. Not to depend on the natural. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit. People all the time do that. They try to handle it. They try to work it out. They try to do this. They try to do that. God says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by, your, by his spirit. See, because the Holy Spirit is a person, we think, he must be like a person like Mama Claire sitting there. One person. He's everywhere present. He's person in essence and nature. Where he has, he has a nature. He can be grieved. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can quench the Holy Spirit. You can only quench a person. We're limited in our knowledge and our understanding of what a person is because when we talk about a person, we expect to see one person one person standing in front of you as you're talking to a person. But he's one person in essence and nature. And when he says it's not by might, not by power, but it's by my spirit, he's talking about a person. So, you know, when we say, Lord, you know, send your holy angels to protect us, that's a good thing, but you know what? You have the Holy Spirit. He's with you always. Holy Spirit is there to give you wisdom and guidance. You know, as Brother Diamond said, the greatest book you can start off reading is the book of Proverbs because it tells you how to live. It's a book of wisdom and understanding. And understanding that book will keep you from harm and danger, making wrong choices and mistakes. Um, you know, when, when a man goes off with a prostitute, you know what the Bible says? It's like a man going, it's like the ox going off to slaughter. Ooh. Okay, it talks about adultery, talks about all kinds of things, lying and, you know, how to overcome, how to have wisdom, you know, how not to be angry. So much stuff in, in the book of, in the book of uh, Proverbs. So again, taking things in the context from which they are written. And principles are first mentioned. Uh, okay, uh, it's also um, demonstrated in events. It's demonstrated in principles. We talked about that. De demonstrated in uh, in events. Uh, Luke seventeen twenty six and twenty seven says, "As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man." Well, what was happening in Noah's day? Well, yeah, corruption, but what else? Homosexual marriage, but what else? Judgment, what else? What's the one thing you could look at today around the world? One word. Lawlessness, okay. Huh? Somebody said something. Sodomy, that's homosexual, yeah. What do you, when you turn on the TV and you see the news, what, what do you see? Violence. That's why God destroyed the earth. He said the earth is full of violence. What do we see today? Violence. 
This guy runs over these people with his truck. This person shoots these people in the school. This guy, this guy goes into a church and kills people in the church. This sniper goes to Las Vegas and kills people. Violence, 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 violence. You're seeing it more and more and more. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. <coughs> and you can tell people this. You can even tell Christians this. And they live like they're going to live forever, that they don't have a care in the world, that they're going to continue in their sin, continue in their unbelief, continue walking halfway with Jesus. And the signs are right there. The signs are there. Now, two things. Either they're too stupid to, to see it, or they don't want to see it. But God is revealing it. God is, God is exposing it. He's allowing it to happen. See, because men are trying to do exactly what it said. By their might, by their power, and not by his spirit. I don't care how many, how many ships we send out, into, uh, out east to fight Kim Jong, Ding Dong, whatever his name is. Okay? Okay? That's not the answer. When are we going to learn? When, when is America going to learn? Will it be too late? The parallel of, of what's going on and what's happened in history before and what's happening now is, is unprecedented. Yet people will continue to lie, to cheat, to steal. They'll continue to live half-hearted half lives to Christ. They won't be committed because they want to do their own thing. They want to live their own life. They want religion, Jesus. But they don't want relationship, Jesus. And those people are the ones that will not make it. And then you've got the lies out there, the super hyper great grace people that are telling you that you don't have to confess your sin anymore. That once you say the sinner's prayer, you're saved. Once saved, always saved. And they, t they promote that lie. And people take that and begin to live haphazard lives, not, not forsaking sin, not obeying God's commandments. So then what, what happens? They take scripture out of context. They don't use the principle of first mention. You know? The Bible says that he'll give his mercy to them that obey his commandments. Okay? You read in 1 John, he says, if you love me, if you say you love me, obey my commandments. He that says he loves me and does not obey my commandments, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. I'm not saying that. Don't get mad at me. I'm not saying that. That's what the scripture says. If you say you love me and you're not obeying my commandments, you're a liar. So you're only fooling yourself. And when the rapture comes, you won't make it. Maybe your family will make it, or maybe your husband will make it, maybe your wife will make it, or somebody will make it in your family, but you won't make it if you're living that, that lie. Because faith without works is, yes. You're not saved because of your works. You're saved by grace, through faith that has works. Amen. All right, so I'll stop there at that scripture, as it was in the days of Noah. We'll, we'll get back into the events and then the symbols and then the persons. There's um, five different principles, I believe. There's places and then prophecy. We'll get into that um, the week after Thanksgiving, maybe, right? Do we have another Wednesday after that? No? Wait, Thanksgiving is on 